experience of suffering. To risk their lives to jump into the waves and carry, actually carry the Jewish immigrants ashore. Some of the survivors told me they cried for the first time after all that they had been through. This made them shed tears. I know if you had seen these blessed children of ours, you would want every child here to have the chance to grow up like them, erect, confident, strong, and pure as the son of Palestine. Flowers. Thank you. Thank you. Where did you ever get them? We made them. Our teacher from the land of Israel showed us how. Oh, you know, in the land of Israel, we love flowers, so. <laughs> and then, Shabbat table, there may be candles, maybe not, and maybe not so much to eat, but there are always flowers. Is this what flowers look like? I never saw a real one. You never saw a flower? No. Dear God. Mrs. Uh, Meyerson. Well, we voted. And? And by a big majority, the children can go first. My dear friend. You mustn't cry. You can be very, very proud of your people. They have nothing left in the world but a place on a list. And they've given that up for others. It's to the everlasting credit of the human race, Mrs. Myerson. Why should you cry? I'm crying for the children. I never saw a flower. On November 29, 1947, the United Nations voted on a recommendation of its own committee that Palestine be partitioned into an Arab state and a Jewish state, with Jerusalem internationalized. A Jewish state without Jerusalem? We could hardly imagine. And there were other things we felt were wrong, but we accepted this partition plan. We were all glued to the radio, of course, following the UN vote with pencil and paper. Yes, no, yes, no. Ten countries, including Great Britain, abstained. Thirteen, including all the Arab countries, opposed. Thirty-three, including the United States, voted in favor. As of midnight, Local time, 
we have the right to be a state. On behalf of the Jewish agency, I want to say something to our Arab neighbors. You fought your battle against us in the United Nations. The majority of the countries in the world believe that this is how it should be. It is not what you wanted. It is not what we wanted. It's a compromise. But now we say to you, a Jewish state can be a great benefit to everyone in the Middle East. We hold out our hand to you. Let's live together in friendship and in peace. with happiness. And you, Golda, you should be the happiest one of all because you worked so hard for it. That's what I came to tell you. How nice of you, Morris. I appreciate it very much. Well, I won't keep you from your friends. No, no, please. So oh, I see you so seldom anymore. Golda... You know that when you made your decision, I thought it was wrong. But in terms of today, it was right. Thank you. I really thank you for that, Morris, because I think about my decision so many times. Every day is not today. You mean there are days when you could possibly have doubts? Last Sunday, for instance, Menachem's recital. You knew about it. I thought, considering how busy you are and how much you travel... I knew, but I couldn't make it. I think Menachem understands that. I told him. Everybody tells him. Tells him what? With his mother. The country comes first. You went to the recital, of course. Of course. Now, how did it go? Well, he plays the cello only a little better than... Pablo Casals. <laughs> oh, my. Tell me, have you heard anything about Sarah lately? I tried to phone her, but that kibbutz is so far out of the Negev, I can't get a call That's through. I have the same trouble, so I went out to see her two weeks ago. You went? You went out there? I heard from friends that Sarah wasn't feeling well, and I got scared. It was the kidney problem, you know? Yes. So I wanted to take her to Jerusalem and put her in the Hadassah hospital. But the kibbutz doctors were sure it's nothing serious. Oh, thank God. Golda, you really went all the way out there. Why are you so surprised? A lot of people would be surprised to know that. A lot of people I don't care about. everything all right with you? Is there anything? Everything's fine. fine. Couldn't be better. Right. 
Oh. I almost forgot the main thing I came to tell you. I heard you on the radio. You were wonderful, Golden. Wonderful speech. months before Israel was to become a state, Arab guerrillas struck at the civilian population all over Palestine. They ignored the United Nations partition plan which called for a transition period before British forces pulled out. Alarmed by this crisis, we called in our two top military men for their appraisal of the situation. Yegal Yadin, chief of operations, and Yisrael Galili, the Haganah commander. So. What is the position? We can be sure of exactly two points. One, on May 15th, the British will pull out. Two, the Arabs will invade. What is the present strength of the Haganah? A hundred thousand able-bodied soldiers, including women. And on the other side? Four hundred thousand Arab soldiers. Four to one. The regular armies of Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Transjordan, if King Abdullah goes in with the Arab League. There is the roughest part of the problem. Abdullah's army is the Arab Legion, British trained by John Bagat Glub, with all the rest of their armies put together. If Abdullah goes in, it could be a calamity. Well, one way or another, what is your projection? We can't make any kind of solid projection. We are asking for your professional opinion. We might as well be honest. We say the Haganah is 100,000, but how many are adequately trained? 10,000. You ask for a professional opinion, but what's my real profession? Archaeology. But all right, in my opinion, we have as much of a chance to win as we have to lose. Fifty-fifty. Could be worse. <laughs> About your note, I, I didn't want to discuss it in front of the others. But why do they think Terence Jordan would go in with the Arab League? King Abdullah himself assured me he wouldn't attack. Our latest intelligence says the opposite. I can't believe it. Well, let me see if Abdullah will meet me at the border again. No, he won't. I made inquiries. You know our Arab expert, Ezra Danin. Yes. Danin says that Abdallah will meet you, but not at the border. This time you will have to go to him, to his capital. I'll go there. I'll go to Amman. It is risky. I wouldn't let you do it, except that if somehow, God knows how, if you could keep Abdallah out of the war, it might save us. When can I go? As soon as we get a plane. People ask sometimes if I was nervous about flying in those little two-seater planes, especially in the days when we couldn't service the engines properly. I don't think I was very nervous. I'd be too worried about whether or not I'd be able to do the jobs I was sent to do. Another reason was, I could usually tell the pilot was nervous enough for both of us.
How are you, Danin? Concerned. We have a three-hour drive to Amman, most of it in Arab territory. We will be stopped at the Arab checkpoints manned by the Arab Legion. No arrangements have been made with those soldiers. Abdallah doesn't want him to know he is receiving a Jewish guest. Are you sure we should be taking such a chance? Danin, if it can save the life of a single Jewish soldier, I'll walk to a man. Oh, I don't speak Arabic. What do I do about that? The last thing in the world you would think of doing, Golda. Keep quiet. Checkpoint. And if they ask me any questions? A Muslim wife in the presence of her husband is not likely to be asked anything. أويت الحرمة من فضلك أويت الحرمة من فضلك يلا يا مسيري ما تخليش الزلمة بيستنى إلا سايب الجديد أويت الحرمة من فضلك أويت الحرمة من فضلك إيه التأخير حرمة من الشكل بتجنن شكرا يلا روح افتح الباب Women don't smoke? Not American cigarettes. Salam, madam. Salam alaikum, Tanin Azizi. Salam alaikum, Habibi Jalali. Thank you.
And what else may I do for you, Mrs. Myerson? I've already said in one word what I came here for. Shalom. Peace. That's all we want. Peace is all I want. Your Majesty, the last time you and I met, we talked about what you thought was the role of the Jews in the scheme of things. Yes. I believe with all my heart that God scattered the Jews throughout the Western world for a purpose. His divine purpose was for you to absorb Western knowledge and progress and then return to the Middle East and share it with us, your fellow Semites. You said you'd always be our friend, that you'd never join in any attack on us. I am still your friend. In the last months we have heard that you were under pressure to join with those who intend to attack us. <laughs> pressure is something I'm always under. <laughs> I sent you a note, and I've never forgotten your answer. You said, Madam, I'm a Bedouin, and a Bedouin always keeps his word. I'm also a king, and a king must keep his word. But beyond all that, I never break a promise I give to a woman. What is the status of that promise now? Why do you people send a woman to deal with me? It's insulting. Your Majesty, she is head of our political action department. Why do you give such an important position to a woman? The Jews traditionally have not held women in much greater esteem than Muslims have. Perhaps this is part of the progress which, as Your Majesty believes, we were scattered throughout the Western world to absorb, inshallah, by the will of God. Inshallah. Well, I suppose I shall have to accept that. My dear madame, when I made you that promise, I was alone. Now I'm one of five. I cannot make decisions alone anymore. It might pay you to keep your independence. As long as there is peace, We'll honor the borders set by the United Nations, including international control of Jerusalem. We have accepted all that. But if we are attacked, then we have to fight. That is all off. We'll take whatever territory we can to improve our position. <laughs> With five countries against you, I cannot see you can take much territory. <laughs> you don't know how our strength has increased during the last months. I understand that you have a daughter living on a kibbutz in the Negev. Revivim? Yes. I happen to know that it is directly in the path of the Egyptian army's plan of attack. You should take your daughter away to some place safe. I appreciate you telling me this. I really do. But most of the young people at Revivim have mothers too. And if all the mothers took their children away, who would stop the Egyptians? I accept that. Your children will do their duty, and I will do mine. And the result will be a lot of bloodshed and destruction, which would be so easy to avoid. Just tell me how. Don't proclaim your state. Not now. Why are you in such a hurry? We waited 2,000 years. I wouldn't call that being in a hurry. <laughs> well, I accept that too. <laughs> well, why can't you wait for a few years more? <laughs> Here is my offer. I will take over all of Palestine 
the Jews may continue to live there under my protection. You will be represented in my parliament. I will take very good care of you. You have my promise. Why do you not believe it? Promises aren't good enough for us anymore. That is the only way I can help you. Why are you so stubborn as to refuse me? Because we must have our old state. And the time is now. And if the only way we can have it is to go to war, we'll go to war. And we'll beat you. If there is a war, it will be her fault. All. Her fault! Because she is a stubborn, arrogant, damned woman. Your Majesty, let's suppose it was a mistake to send me here. Would it be helpful for you to meet with David Ben-Gurion? Not really. If Mr. Ben-Gurion were to announce that he had made peace with me, he would be hailed as a hero. If I were to announce that I had made peace with him, I would be murdered. Less than four years later, King Abdallah was shot dead by an Arab assassin. At that time, I thought, dear God, what would have happened to us had we been a minority in an Arab country under his protection. But on this night, I could only think about the Arab Legion joining four other armies against us. The Legion had tanks. All through the long, dangerous trip back, I said to myself, I failed. There will be war. Some scenes from A Woman Called Gola, Part 2. We hereby proclaim the establishment of the Jewish state to be called Israel. We'll pay for the birth of our nation with our blood. You know, uh, when somebody asked me how I could make a woman my foreign minister, I said, Golda is the best man in my cabinet. <laughs> After the divorce, would you marry me? Oh, we both have such important work. This is me. Would you be willing to take over as prime minister? I don't even know what you're saying. Nobody thinks we should call up the reserves? Is this because nobody wants to upset the country? Three days before Yom Kippur? We blame you for the war. You should resign! And so should he! I'm glad you came. I am glad too. Very glad I came. So, let me ask you. What took you so long? story so far. Golda, the cigarette. What's the matter? You're afraid I'll die young. The children, we're almost there. In 1977, Golda Meir returned to her grammar school in Milwaukee. We welcome to the 4th Street School our most distinguished graduate, Mrs. Golda Meir. How shall I describe her? to people all over the world. She was one of the great women of this century. Some say she was the greatest. It's hard for me to judge. To me, she was my longtime dear friend. This is the dream I've had. Ever since I was a little girl in Russia, 
frightened for my life. The dream that we can have the same peace and security other people have. The only way we're ever going to get it is in a Jewish homeland. If I won't go, you won't marry me. I'd love to marry you, Morris. I was thinking of a baby. I didn't hear that. I'm saying I think we should have a child. Really? When did the committee tell you we could go to work on this child? You are a very capable person. Whatever you do, you do well. So, we want you to be a delegate to the Histadrut. Me? Oh, no, Ariel. I couldn't. I don't want to spend the rest of my life feeling sick and useless. Where will you go? It's up to you. If you'll come with me, I'll stay in Palestine. If not, I'll go back to America. So, we left the kibbutz, which I was very unhappy about. And we went to live in Jerusalem. And the years passed. Uh, Morris became a bookkeeper, and I became the mother of two children. You're not working? Well, I wouldn't call bringing up two small children exactly loafing. <laughs> well, I wouldn't call it anything very much, considering how badly we need your capabilities. He's got some hell of a nerve. Trying to talk you into Tel Aviv when I work in Jerusalem. He didn't have to try very hard. I took the job, Morris. In the years following the separation from Morris, Golda was intensely involved in Israel's struggle for independence. One whole year! You're trying to say somebody who came last week should go ahead of me. If I'll stay much longer, I'll die here. No, no, we're trying to get you all off. But the children first. On May 15th, the British will pull out. Two, the Arabs will invade. What is the present strength of the Haganah? A hundred thousand able-bodied soldiers. And on the other side? Four hundred thousand Arab soldiers. If you could keep Abdallah out of the war, it might save us. We must have our old state, and the time is now. And if the only way we can have it is to go to war, we'll go to war. And we'll beat you. If there is a war, it will be her fault. All. Her fault! Because she's a stubborn, arrogant, Damned woman. On this night, I could only think about the Arab Legion joining four other armies against us. I said to myself, I failed. There will be war. In a moment, a woman called Golda continues. By the middle of February, Arab guerrilla attacks had already started. In four months, the British were scheduled to leave, and the Arab countries were certain to invade us. We needed arms. According to Ben Gurion, to equip a Jewish army would require $25 million. There's only one country in the world in which we can raise so much money in so little time. I'm going to the United States immediately. I must make our American friends understand how serious the situation is. Excuse me, PG. I'm sorry to interrupt. But you can't possibly leave at a time like this. Look, what you are doing here, I can't do. But I might be able to do what you want to do in America. What makes you think that you can raise this kind of money? Two reasons. I speak the language. So do I. And the other? I'm American. This is too important. Let us put it to a vote. A vote? Are you calling a vote to overrule me? Why not? We are founding the only democracy in the Middle East. In a democracy, the majority rules. Those in favor of sending Golda. Opposed? 
None. Golda goes. No. Democracy. Probably, but Ben Gurion insists that I take the plane this afternoon. Why? <laughs> I think he's trying to get even with me. What a life. We don't even have time for ourselves, let alone for each other. Well, maybe when I'll get back. I probably won't be here. Really? Where are you going? Pilsen. Pilsen? What's that? There's very good beer in Pilsen. Pilsen beer is famous. Well, yeah, what is this? You're not going to Czechoslovakia to drink beer. Well, I'm, I'm leaving right away. Now, Ariel, please tell me. Well, you know that we have been trying to put together an air force for the Hagen Art. Uh -huh. Hood has managed to buy some Messerschmitt 109 fighter planes. Well, what is in Pilsen besides beer is the Skoda munitions factory. They made Messerschmitts for the Germans. And I am going there to hire aircraft mechanics. Well, of course, I know the Czech government has been selling us arms, but the situation is very unstable there now. By the time you get there, the Soviet Union could be running things. And I wouldn't trust those fellows to be any friends of ours. How do you know? They would even let a Jewish agent into the country. I don't. And I certainly don't have time to be held up at the border while they bury me in red tape. So. Do you have an answer for that? Well, I uh, will parachute in. No! No, don't do it, Ariel. No, please forget the whole idea. It's all wrong for you. Why is it wrong for me? Because, because you're too badly needed here. Let someone else go. I am one of the very few people who can speak the language. Mm. Oh, no. For hiring mechanics, any businessman would do better. And how many businessmen do you think we have with parachute training? Hmm? The trading is one thing. This is different. What is different? We'll never see each other again. Go down. Do you really think that you can talk me out of going? Not for a minute. You have to understand, Mrs. Myerson, this is not a Zionist organization. Some of these people, maybe a lot of them, are just not interested in Palestine. And all of them are sick and tired of hearing how badly we need money. Yeah. Well, frankly, they're under pressure to raise funds for institutions in America. Jewish hospitals, Jewish charities all over the country, they need money too. It might be better if you didn't address this group, Mrs. Myerson. Wait, and let us set up a more favorable audience. No, I have to get through to these people. Well, then, it might be a good idea if you let me take a look at your speech. I haven't prepared a speech. You mean you don't know what you're going to say? I'll know when the time comes to say it. Please believe me when I tell you I did not come to the United States only because 700,000 Jews are in danger of being killed. That is not the issue. The issue is that if the Jews of Palestine survive, then the Jews of the world survive with them. And their freedom will be assured forever. But if these 700,000 are wiped off the face of the earth, then there'll be no Jewish people as such. 
and for centuries to come, all our hopes and dreams of a Jewish nation, a Jewish homeland will be smashed. My friends, when I say that we need money immediately, I don't mean next week. I mean right now. In less than four months, we'll be fighting for our lives against cannon and armor. It is not for you to decide whether we'll fight. That decision is taken. We will fight. We'll pay for the birth of our nation with our blood. That is normal. The best of us will fall, that is certain. There is only one thing for you to decide, whether we'll win or we'll lose. Golda raised not $25 million. She raised 50. The money went directly to the capitals of the world where Ben Gurion had sent agents to purchase arms for the Haganah. And in a converted museum, one day before the scheduled pullout, an historic event. Exiled from the land of Israel, the Jewish people have returned believing in their self-evident right to be a nation like all other nations in their own sovereign state. I imagine every people that declares its independence goes through difficulties. But for us, there was such deadly danger that some of our friends strongly advised us not to proclaim independence. But we were determined to do it anyway. By virtue of this right, and of the resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, we hereby proclaim the establishment of the Jewish state in Palestine to be called Israel. The next day, May 15th, right on schedule, Israel was invaded by the armies of six countries. Weapons bought with the money Golda had raised began to arrive in chartered ships. Rifles, hand grenades, artillery pieces. One of the first ships brought 10 Messerschmitt fighter planes and aircraft mechanics from Czechoslovakia. In a few more days, the Arabs were being driven back or contained on all fronts. And with her work done, Golda flew home from America. Hello, I'm Golda. I'm going to make a speech. It will be short, so don't expect much. All right, PJ. <laughs> One day. When history is written, it will be recorded there was a woman who made it possible for the Jewish state to be born. In the United Nations General Assembly, the Arab countries now accepted a proposal for a ceasefire. It left Israel with some gains over the partition plan, but it divided Jerusalem with the old city in Jordanian hands. And despite the UN agreement, for the next 19 years, Jews were denied access to their holiest site, the western wall of Solomon's temple. And the problem of the Palestinian refugees was created.
I'm sure some Palestinian Arabs fled because they were frightened. But many left because their leaders told them to, promising that after we were driven into the sea, they would come back and take over Jewish property. Of course, we were not driven into the sea. And those people became homeless. None of the Arab countries would give them a home. Only two would even let them in, and they confined them to refugee camps. They are the only people in history to remain refugees after 30 years. Now, David Ben-Gurion was the first Prime Minister of Israel, and he appointed me to his cabinet as Minister of Labour. So, I needed an assistant, and a lady named Lou Kadar applied for the job. I speak English, French even better. I was born in France. How are you at writing letters? Oh, would you like to see a sample? I read that a Steve Doring company executive just died. You might want to send a letter of condolence. What a beautiful letter. Did you know this man? Yes, actually. Was he as much of a saint as you say? Him? He was a son of a bitch. Well, you might be very good at this job. Do you think you'd like working with me? I would love it. How do you know that you'd love it? I was with the Haganah. I, I was wounded. I haven't worked since I got out of hospital. Madam Minister, I'm tired of being hungry all the time. That's a good answer. All right, as far as I'm concerned, the job is yours. But I have to check with Ben-Gurion before it's definite. Oh, will that be a problem? Absolutely not. No problem at all. What's the name again? Kada. Luke Kada. Never heard of him. Her. The point is not whether you've ever heard of her. Correct. The point is you don't need her. I'm sending you a very fine man. He's been liaison to the Zionist office in Geneva. He can not only write you effective speeches in Hebrew, but also in English, and French, and Spanish. Plus, he's a very great administrator. He'll make your office run like a watch. His name is Rottenberg. Well, you seem to be very enthusiastic about him. I am enthusiastic about him. Fine. You take Rothenberg for your assistant, I'll take Luke Kadar for mine. Israel had peace, or what was hoped would be peace, and with it, a tidal wave of immigrants. Jews not only from Europe, but from Arab countries, from Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, Tunisia, Morocco, Yemen. The Minister of Labor had to find them jobs. Shalom, Mr. Friedenbach. How is it going? Well, Madam Minister, you have to understand that these men have held a brick or a cement block in their hands before. Mm. I do, of course. We depend on you to teach them. Well, they learn quickly. But I have a problem. Yes. In my group, there are ten men. And I speak only six languages. <laughs> To Golda personally, peace meant a little more time for everyday things, such as washing her hair as often as she liked. She also had a tea kettle that was never shiny enough for her. She told me she enjoyed polishing it when she was alone. If she felt lonely, she'd polish twice as hard. But as a cabinet minister, Golda had too many concerns to be alone very often. One developed from a visit to Israeli kibbutzim by United States Senator Hubert Humphrey. I must say I am impressed by what these teachers are accomplishing with retarded children. As you know, I have a particular interest in special education because of a grandchild. Yes, so I understand, Senator. Uh, may I ask you uh, another question, possibly a little sensitive? Certainly. What about these young couples living together who aren't married? 
Would you like to sit down, Sandin? Personally, I never thought much about it. To me, the main thing would be if people love each other. Oh, Mrs. Meyerson, the main thing is the children. The children? Of course. What happens to the children of those couples? Are they accepted by your society or are they stigmatized? Are they legally legitimate or are they bastards? I don't think it's much of a problem for us. Why isn't it? Couples that aren't married tend not to have children. But that problem is even worse. Your country needs to increase its population, doesn't it? And a whole sector of your strongest and healthiest young people refuses to help. Santa, you're absolutely right. Look, we know who we are and what our commitment is. We don't need a piece of paper to tell us. You love each other. You have a commitment to each other. But it's so wrong being married to each other. Nobody says there's anything wrong with it. But nobody's going to push us into it. Push you into it? Who would ever do such a thing? Let me ask you, do you like this room you're living in? Mm, not very much. I thought not, huh? Too close to the chickens. <laughs> would you like to be assigned a room near the flowers? Of course we would. I can arrange that. Oh, what about that icebox running all over the floor? I'm sure you wouldn't mind an electric fridge. I can arrange that, too. What's the catch? Catch? No catch. All I ask in return is something you yourself say nothing is wrong with. Get married. Would you come to the wedding, Golda? She went to many weddings and also to a funeral. In 1951, her husband Morris died. I remember thinking, as though it weren't too late to tell him, Dear Morris, I loved you so in those early days. Things changed for us, but in a way, they stayed the same. I never lost that feeling for you, never. I thought how he loved our children, and they adored him. I thought, Maurice, at least we can be glad that Sarah's marriage is working out so much better than ours. But mainly, I kept thinking how very sad he was the last years of his life. And I was guilty, because I could always get him to do pretty much what I wanted. But I couldn't be the wife that he wanted and should have had. In the end, whatever I was able to accomplish, he paid for. Shalom. Maurice. Golda was Israel's labor minister for seven years, doing what she loved best, working with people to provide the solid things that people needed, like housing, and some of the things that turn a desert into a homeland, like trees. During that time, I suppose I became the typical doting Jewish grandmother. Some people said I was trying to make up for not having been a doting Jewish mother to my own children. <laughs> well, I suppose they were right. Anyway, between the joy that the children gave me and the satisfaction of doing my job, these were beautiful years, the best of my life. With the coming to power, of Colonel Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, the end of Golda's beautiful years was inevitable. From bases around Israel's borders, Nasser sent terror squads called Fedayeen to stage indiscriminate attacks, such as the killing of six children and their teacher in an agricultural school. The official Cairo radio made Nasser's intention clear. Daya 
Weep, O Israel. The day of your extermination draws near. We have found the way to strike you. There will be no more arguments at the United Nations. There will be no peace. We demand the death of Israel. And violence even found its way into the Israeli parliament. saved Ben-Gurion's life that day. For the rest of her life, she carried shrapnel in her leg. So, I can believe what they told me. You're all right. I'll be back in the office tomorrow, if I live. If not, I'll be back the day after. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Golda, speaking of living, I didn't want to mention this while your husband was alive, but you still haven't taken a Hebrew name. Well, I see no reason to change Meyerson. It's policy, Gold. You know well that every member of the government is expected to have a Hebrew name, and especially someone with your high visibility outside Israel, which is going to be even higher. What is this now, BG? Moshe Sharet is leaving the cabinet to become secretary general of the Labour Party. Who is going to be foreign minister? You? No. I can't believe you mean such a thing. I certainly mean it. No, no. No, in the first place, I don't want to leave the Labour Ministry. That's my kind of work. Not a foreign ministry is full of sophisticated intellectuals with Oxford and Cambridge education. How could I fit in with them? You will make them fit in with you. I know you will. You know, uh, when somebody asked me how I could make a woman my foreign minister, you know what I said? I said, Golda, he's the best man in my cabinet. Excuse me, BG, if I'm not wild about uh, the compliment. Fine, don't be wild, but don't be your stubborn self either. You're taking over as foreign minister and that's that. I am stubborn, huh? Now, about changing your name. I thought of a name that's very close to Myerson. Meir. It's a fine old Hebrew word that means it means to illuminate, to, to shed light. Golden Meir. Golden light. You should give this your most serious consideration. Anything else I should do? Yes. You must understand that it is not in my nature to make a fuss about what you did for me as much as I appreciate it. Don't you think I know that? And another thing. There must be no argument about it. You've got to take a little better care of yourself. Don't be in such a hurry to, to come back to work. Or go and spend some time in a nice hotel on the seashore. Rest. Relax. Let your leg heal. Caesarea is a nice place. No argument, BG. I'll do exactly as you say. A week should be more than enough. Almost as soon as Golda Meyerson became Golda Meir, Israel's second foreign minister, she had the problem of Israel's second war. The Arab leaders had never accepted peace. Egypt's President Nasser had nationalized the Suez Canal and closed it to Israeli ships. And he was staging a massive military build-up with weapons supplied by the Soviet Union. On October 29, 1956, under the command of Chief of Staff Moshe Dayan, the Israeli army, mostly reservists, crossed into the Sinai Peninsula. They took the Gaza Strip, plus the entire Sinai, in less than a hundred hours. But military victory turned into political defeat at the United Nations. Israel came under intense pressure to withdraw. And in response to United Nations guarantees of freedom of navigation for Israeli ships, 
and all shipping in the Gulf of Aqaba, and an end to terrorist raids. My government is prepared to announce plans for a full and prompt withdrawal from the Sinai and the Gaza Strip. Now, may I add a few words to the neighbors of Israel? Can we, from now on, all of us, turn over a new leaf? Can we act like sisters and brothers should? Instead of fighting each other, can we fight poverty, disease, illiteracy, hatred, has never made one child in your countries happier. The implements of death has never converted a hovel into a house. Isn't it possible that we could put all our efforts, our energies into one single purpose, the betterment of all our lands and all our people through the blessings of peace? There was some polite applause but not from the Arabs. So I knew we were making a mistake to withdraw. There would be no peace. Our soldiers who were killed and wounded had only bought us a little time, and we would have to fight again. Thank you, Thank Mr. You, Mr. President. President. In the 1960s, there was only one woman foreign minister in the world, and almost anybody in the world could tell you her name was Golda. Golda traveled to the capitals of Europe, to the United States and Canada, to Latin America, Japan, the Philippines, Burma, Ethiopia, and other places. I traveled with her, and I believe she felt that of all the continents, she was able to accomplish the most in Africa. Golda set up a program for thousands of Africans to come to Israel to study subjects like hydrology and agriculture. And thousands of Israeli doctors, engineers, and technical specialists were sent to Africa. Mrs. Mayor, my question is, why is Israel going to the considerable expense of this program? Israel is a small and poor nation that has learned some hard lessons about economic and social development. We feel the responsibility to share what we've learned with other small and poor nations. Mrs. Mayer, that sounds very nice, but I am from Algeria. Your country is being armed by France. That government is fighting a brutal and ruthless war against our people. How do you justify your intimacy with a power that's the enemy of self-determination for the African people? Our neighbors are out to destroy us. They get up-to-date weapons from the Soviet Union, free of charge. Most of our friends, for whatever reason, won't sell us arms. The only country that will sell to us and for a lot of hard currency, let me tell you, is France. If President de Gaulle was the devil himself, I would expect my government to buy from him what we need to defend ourselves. And if you were in my position, sir, what would you do? Madam, at least you live up to your publicity, which says that you are honest. <laughs> you come, come now, come. Thank <laughs> you. 
a minute. All right, Abby. What's all right? We don't know where they're taking you. Don't worry, Abby. Mrs. Cadell, maybe they let a woman in that hut. I mean, how do we know what they may do to her? From Kiev and Pinsk and Milwaukee. <laughs> what happened? I'm now a member of the secret society of the Zoe tribes women. I'm the only foreign woman they have ever admitted. <laughs> oh, you I must have a photograph of my grandchildren. Oh, yes, we take a picture, but uh, what went on in that hut? Oh, it is a secret society. It was a secret ceremony. I'll never tell. <laughs> And she never did. And then, do you know what he wanted? Are you still talking about Idi Amin? Yes, yes, Idi Amin, the machine gunner. <laughs> when I told him I couldn't give him six fighter planes, he asked for ten million pounds sterling. <laughs> Oh, I couldn't stop <laughs> laughing. <laughs> and well, then he threatened to go to the enemy, meaning Libya. <laughs> I should have handled it better, but... <laughs> Goldie, you never chat. Hmm? What? Chat. Small talk. Especially at a dinner like this, you never do. Hmm? Oh, you want to chat, huh? <laughs> no. Chat. Chat. Well, you, you know that uh, Gabby wants a divorce. I think if uh, she has a chance to be happy with somebody else, by all means, she should take this chance. I think we should have the same chance. Golda, after the divorce, would you marry me? Hmm? Now, this isn't fair. You say chat. Is this a subject for chatting? Compared to Idi Amin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I must sleep on it. I must wash my hair and think. Oh, we both have such important work. Golda, stop but thinking But being married work. would interfere. Isn't it too late for us anyway? Start thinking about yourself for a change, hmm? before it really is too late. Hello? Ah, good morning, Lou. Oh, beautiful.